Hello and greetings to all. Um, been a while since I put out a video. Sorry about that. I actually I sprained my elbow, and um, that hasn't been fun. Uh, not to complain. I mean, it could be worse. But it, it's about sixty to seventy percent back now. But um, you know, it's kind of hard one-handed um, doing these experiments and or like filming things. So I'm I'm not going to show too much here. I'll try and show something before I wrap it up. Um, but just I have been doing some more experimentation. Just kind of talk to talk through, and you know give the the thirty thousand foot view, um, so that I'm not just diving into the weeds, and um, so you can see what I've been working on. You know sometimes there's some method to this. Sometimes I'm just kind of like wandering around. Um, you know, whatever catches my interest. It's a bit of both, but um, let me shut up and just describe what I've been doing. So again, this is stuff I've gone over before, but let's go over it again. So here's your test bed. Here's your two bus lines, positive and negative. Here are two, I think they're 400 volt, 100 UF caps. I had to buy those because I've there were two things I've been working on and I've, I've somewhat solved to at least mitigated the issues with both of them. Um, the first was getting back opto isolation. Um, so before I had, so you have you have your bus line. Your bus line goes into right now. I have it going into ten to two ten uf caps, and then for most of this, I had it going out. Oh, that hurts holding this with one hand. Um, going out to two. Um, 10 UF caps here for reasons I'll go into right now. I'm just sending it out to this 100 UF um, film cap So As I was saying then what happens is you have power into the bus lines when those two white SSRs close and they're controlled by pin 13 that line goes to the other one that pin 13 controls both power flows in and fills up these two caps when this center cap controlled by pin 12 closes so you fill it up and then you open those two again so now you have you know everything opto isolated and you just have your voltage sitting in these film caps isolated from the bus lines isolated from the arduino now when this opto isolated um, SSR closes it discharges I don't have the coil hooked up now but it discharges through the coil discharging the cap you have a backwards diode there and then you have another line coming from the other end of the coil and so that's a, a, a buck boost DC DC converter and you gather that inductive spike I was gathering it into two um, similar film caps there. Right now it's being shunted out to here as I'll talk about later. So you know conceptually this isn't complicated at all. You're just taking a cap and you're discharging it through a coil and then you gather in the spike. And then these are in place so that if you want you no longer run it off the power source you run it off of these and you see how much these go down for what you're getting here and that that gives you a very clean test of efficiency so let's take a quick <laughs> quick look at and for some reason the light came on on the on the thing I don't want the light on it was on it, it would be good there it's not good here okay um, we can take a quick look at the code and so you know I don't need all of these pins um, I, I just put them in in case you need them um, so on time is defined as a hundred microseconds and then again I define all the pins and I'm not doing anything with the with the serial thing there either right now but you know it doesn't hurt to have it in there in case you want to do something later but this is the, then the meat of it so you have a for loop and it says for I from I right now to 245 pin 13 high and pin 13 fills up your film caps there those guys and then you shut it off so you only want that on for 
as long as it takes to fill the caps up and then off as quickly as you can. So I might be able to get away with 100 or even 50 microseconds, you know, just as quick as the thing can shut off. And this could maybe go down a little further too. Then you have um, next pin 12 goes high and pin 12 is discharging those two caps through the coil and it goes high for on time which we defined earlier as 100 microseconds you can define it as whatever you want and then off for 100 microseconds so the duty cycle is 50 percent and you could change that as well you could say you know on time times two or on time divided by two or something like that then after it does that for i guess it was 245 times you know currently in the for loop then you go out and you see what's in here, and that's what this part of the code is about. So you say um, pin eight high. So you're saying pin eight high, and then you delay for two seconds. And pin eight is just going out, it's not a real good connection there, but it's going out and lighting that LED to give you visual feedback. And this does two things. First of all, if you're measuring what voltage shows up in your gather cap, be it this one or, or two smaller ones there, that gives the two seconds for it to, to show up on your meter. And you can say, oh, I got five volts, oh, I got 10 volts, oh, I got 50 volts. Then pin 11 goes high. Pin 11 goes to here, and this is also not hooked up. I accidentally fried this pin, and um, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is fix that. Um, and pin 11 then shorts this cap, not through a coil or anything. You just want to get rid of it because you've seen what you need to. And then um, pin 11 goes low, and then pin 8 goes low, you wait another two seconds. Now the other thing that this visual feedback does is if you want to run it off of the caps here, you know that you have got, as soon as that light turns on, that you're out of your for loop and you're not running the discharges through the coil. And so that gives you the time to pull and disconnect one of the lines and let it run off of these the next time around to see how far it goes down. And if you wait until the cap shuts off, then you have two seconds. So that means, you know, it's not going to be leaking out too much through the meter um, when you do that. And so that that's what that does. And just to quickly go through the, the great outlines in the code. You know, sometimes you run into an issue and you're not sure what it is. So here, those delay 1000s while this thing is discharging are so, so that you can slow everything down to one second. And then you can, you know, say, put the cap on here. Is, is power making it into here? Is it discharging? You know, and, and it helps you to uh, debug. And then further down here, uh, let's see if my elbow will comply. Um, I don't know what that or that are for, but this in time, uh, on time equals on time minus 200. Sometimes you want to do something similar to a frequency sweep where you are just changing the on time from say 2000 down to 100 and that just lets that go automatically. But what what I'm doing here is once I've found a good, you know, like, okay, 100 microseconds is good for this coil, then you figure out how many pulses you need to go from, if you're inputting 10 volts, to go from 0 to 10 volts in your gather cap. Okay, so, um, you know, it, it might let's say at 200 microseconds it takes you know 250 pulses and then you turn it to 100 microseconds and ends up being 245. Um, one thing you have to be careful with when you're at high voltage and that's how I fried one of the SSRs is if you recompile it at the wrong time then this cap doesn't discharge and if you're running it like 100 and that goes up to 200 
And there's one other thing I'll just mention. Hey, the light came on. That's good. If anyone cares to, you know, kind of replicate the same. Um, and this, this one took me a little while to figure out. Um, but you have to remember that this is an inverting DC-DC converter. So in other words, let's say you put 100 volts into those caps and you're going to see how many pulses to get 100 volts here. Because it's inverting, this is actually technically a negative 100. There's no polarity to these, these film caps, but that's negative 100, this is 100. So what both this and that, those two switches are seeing when it happens is 200 volts. So you need to go to 100 volts, you need a minimum of a 200 volt SSR. I think that one's a 300 volt and I, you know, I took this up to, you know, it was like 160 volts before I, oh no, and kapoof, you could kind of hear it. Um, and so that's what I need to, to fix. And just, you know, like one other thing if people are looking, you know, do something like this. Another thing that I found useful is I just have a program here called Blink All Pins. So I'm I'm pretty sure that it's that cap that fried, but I don't know 100%. So what you do is, you know, you get rid of all this, you turn this down to 3 volts, and you say Blink All Pins, and this just blinks every pin on for a second and off for a second. And then you just put an LED in, in each place, and you see, alright, where's the problem? And then you fix it. So that, that's also useful for debugging. So just a little bit more 30,000 foot view stuff and then um, we'll go in the spreadsheet and then I'll wrap it up by getting this thing running and you know there's not really anything to see but um, you can like see the meter go. Um, so originally I was using for all of these SSRs Comus AC37s and they're 60 volt um, SSRs and they switch down to about 50 microseconds and recall that you know this is inverting so if you go over 30 volts you fry one of your Comus AC 37s so the first thing I did was I got rid of the Comus AC 37 I used a non opto isolated you know 200 volt MOSFET and that worked great out to 60 volts. You can go out to 60 volts now, and you can also go down to, you know, five, you know, one microsecond. However fast your Arduino will go, it'll, it's, the Arduino is slower than the MOSFET. So that was nice, but then you're not opto-isolated, so you have to think, and you, you know, it's unlikely, but in the back of your mind, there's a, an electrical connection here, and hence there. So, um, you know, you don't, you're not as competent as you are if everything's opto isolated and further uh, if i get into it in this video there's another thing that you can't see when you don't have full opto isolation so i needed to get back opto isolation and there were two things you need to be able to go higher voltage and you also want to be able to go fast so the first thing that i tried was just using um i had these 4 and 35 um uh, optocouplers just can you run it through the optocoupler itself? And, you know, those only go up to 50 volts, but they switch down to about 5 microseconds. No, I mean, it works, but you just can't get enough current through the opto-isolator. Now, they do have some opto-isolators that um, are hooked internally to a, um, a Darlington transistor, so they're going to have a bit more current that they can that they can push through and they go up to 350 volts. If I go around, get around to making an opto isolated setup myself with an opto isolator to a MOSFET, I'll probably pick some of those up. They're, they're like 30 cents. Um, and they go out to 300 volts, they switch down to five, uh, four, three microseconds, something like that. And I think if you do opto-isolate with, a, uh, I don't know this because I haven't built a circuit, but I, I'm pretty sure, no, I said, shouldn't say I'm pretty sure, I don't know, but I suspect that if you do, um, like, have opto-isolator to a MOSFET or to a um, BJT, that if you're running 100 volts, I think the opto isolator also has to be a 100 volt one. Um, I don't think you could put 100 volts through your BJT or your MOSFET 
and have a 30 volt uh, transistor. Maybe, but I'm, I, I suspect not. Um, so those 350 volt, I haven't picked them up yet. I mean, 30 cents is, you know, you got to think about it. Um, but I'll pick those up and I might, I might try and do that because if what I'm trying to do then is have something opto isolated that I can switch down to five microseconds. But what I did instead was I just started looking at everything I had on hand for the solid state relays and, um, I have some that actually do a little bit better than the MOSFET with the large coil. They're not as fast as the MOSFET, uh, but I've gotten them, you know, down to, you know, some down to like 40 microseconds or something like that. And um, this one is a 400 volt one. I've also got a 600 volt one that works well. So you could go 200 or 300 volts max. So it's not going to work well with a, a faster coil like this, but a coil with a lot of inductance, like this this big red one, you'll be fine with the SSR that can only switch down to about 40 microseconds, because for whatever reason, things stop improving with a coil like that at maybe 100, maybe 80, maybe 120 microseconds. And I, I'm beginning to think that's the property of the coil and not not one of the components. But with a coil like this, which weighs, you know, one tenth, you can do not as well, but you can do get in the same ballpark if you can get down to five or ten microseconds. Now, maybe I'm boring people to tears, but I'm going to go on. The reason I think, I actually, I'd say this one improves down to about 25 microseconds. This one down to about 80 or 100. And I'm starting to think that it's skin effect and that once you're going faster than that, the skin effect becomes so predominant that the resistance is just increasing greatly. And so that's why it stops improving. So let me let me now go to um, some of the data that I've, I've gathered um, working one-handed. And so here's a spreadsheet. We have cap one, and there, there are two of them. And so I measured the capacitance, and that's the UFs. And then cap two, that's these two, and measure that. And then I summed all those, and it's 198.763. So that's all of the the capacitance on this side. And then um, pretend this isn't here. What I was doing was I had those two in there. And so those two caps there. And so the total capacitance there adds up to that. Now I doubled everything because you're sometimes measuring this capacitor. And um, when it's 10 UF, it leaks out pretty quickly. When it's 20 UF, it leaks out a little bit more slowly. And likewise, when you have that two second delay, when you're going to run it off the cap, because you have 200 instead of 100 UF, then it, it leaks out um, less slowly there. So, you know, the more, uh, I should, you know, make it like a thousand and, and a thousand or something like that, or a thousand and a hundred. But right now I don't have those those pieces. And also, um, you know, if I'm going up to uh, 200 volts, uh, you know, heaven knows what the, the voltage of the spike would actually be. And it wouldn't be real fun to have, um, you know, 400 volts or something like that sitting in a cap like that. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be a problem unless, uh, unless you got shocked by it. So, um, so there's sort of a trade-off there. But let's go back to here. And so, you know, on, on your one side, you have 198 and on the other side, 19. So let's just, let's, we can see that this is just about 10 times bigger than that. So let's just make up um, some figures. Let's say that you had a one millifarad cap and you discharge it, one millifarad cap at 10 volts and you discharge it into a hundred UF, a one tenth millifarad cap at zero volts. What do the two equalize to? 
and we know that they follow conservation of charge not conservation of energy but that's another story they follow conservation of charge and so that 10 volts on the the one millifarad once they're connected together now has 1.1 millifarads to spread out over and so the ending voltage of those caps once they're connected together is 10 elevenths the starting voltage so they both are at 9.09 .09 volts now we're not doing exactly that here we're saying the gather cap which is you know one tenth the size of of the caps here is at zero volts and we're bringing it up to 10 volts so again it's not it's not like rocket science here if a cap one tenth of the size goes from zero to 10 volts and you have 10 volts in a cap 10 times bigger it has to go down to nine volts if you just connect the two if you just connected the two it wouldn't go to 10 volts but in order for conservation of charge to to remain valid for that cap to go from zero to ten then a cap ten times as large goes from ten to nine simple but that isn't what you see what you see is that the gather cap let's say here I'm just testing the first of the SSRs and I'm testing it at 10 volts with a 100 microsecond pulse it took 47 pulses and to get that the one tenth the size cap up to 10 volts and the cap only discharged the big cap to 9.41 instead of going down to 9 now I mean that's not as exciting as it seems because that's what happens with every step down transformer in the world and um, you know they have step down transformers that are probably 98 99 maybe 99 plus percent efficient um, but that's what you see that that um, when you're going with the step down transformer now conservation of charge is violated and and so that's uh, I mean that's interesting it, it happens every every you know second on the electric grid however you know the electric grid is not using pulse DC 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 converters it uh, switch mode it's using AC transformers this is a DC pulse DC buck boost converter so there are differences the one is that it's generally less efficient you know if you buy buy it off of uh, you know digikey or something but I said this was coils and voltage, so let's let's get to the point. Now that we're a half hour in, so here it is at 10 volts with this with this one. It took 47 pulses at 100 microseconds. It went to 9.41. Now you go up to 20 volts. It only takes 44 pulses. I think part of that is that there's the 0 0.6 volt drop across the. Um, the diode but now it went to 18.88 volts when when those two discharged so if we divide that by two it would be like going to 9.44 volts now at 30 volts 9.45 at 50 volts 9.454 for reasons that I'm not going to go into at the moment um, if it was 9.5 volts the I gotta deal with my elbow. If this was 9.5 volts, that would be 100% efficient. Um, I, I can discuss that at another time. And um, because you're at, you know, because you're at 9.454 instead of 9, what that's saying is that this is 82% efficient, this is 90.8% efficient that's the the change in your efficiency from going to 10 to 50 volts so then i started looking at others and interestingly the 600 volt one worked a lot better than the 400 volt one i'm not even sure what specs to look at on the you know the data sheet i'm starting to think it might be related to the the maximum uh pulse amps uh, as much as anything else 
Now this one, it went from 9.42, 9.445, 9.456 at 30 volts, 50 volts up to 9.472. So that is 94.4% um, efficient. Here I went to these Panasonic AQV 104s, uh, 300 volt ones. Again, right out to 60 volts. It's a pretty clean improvement. And then I did it again for some reason. You can see the number of pulses that you need goes from 58 to 51. And that's what you get. Now, when I got over 60 volts, there's a there's a few problems that I ran into. And, you know, some of them are kind of stupid. So the first problem is this guy goes to 60, this guy goes to 50. I had no way of getting past 60 volts easily. Now they have 120 volt, um, 0 to 120 volt DC power supplies I'm seeing on Amazon for 89 bucks. So I might pick one of those up. But <laughs> what I did is I just hooked them in series. And um, I don't know if someone's going to be like, Mon Tui, man. You'll blow up the whole city block. Uh, I don't know. It's probably a stupid idea, but it it works. It works fine. It works beautifully. But um, you know, I don't know what kind of amperage you can put out, and um, I I hope it doesn't fry either of these. But so far, so good. So that lets me go to to 110 volts. Now, if I want to go past that, you know, just talking, you could you could do a. a you know a buck boost converter the problem with doing that is if you use those things i mean they always want to just keep going up depending on the resistance so it's like if you take the meter off then if you had it set at like 100 volts it'll drift up to like 105 volts because um it's no longer draining off through the meter so what you probably want to do is is set up a charge pump um which you know is just putting the voltage into two caps in parallel and then discharging them in series and then you can double the voltage or you can do three caps and you could triple the voltage so if this holds up and you did three caps then you have zero to um 330 volts which is all that i can do with the components and and um and whatnot but that would that would be how you would do that the other thing is that when it goes from 60 to 70 volts you lose one digit of precision and I don't know if it goes to a different resistor network. So it started to look worse. You know, this nice clean improvement and then it looked worse at 70 volts. So that's why I did two things. I, I put it into this giant cap and you know, now this is just discharging a lot. So you have more discrimination, you know, because now it's like 7.47. And it looks like it's still improving. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is you have this nice improvement. Let's take, let's take this one, 9.42, 9.44, 9.46. Um, and then, you know, getting out to 70 volts, it's like, oh, this is becoming more difficult now. And so you're tempted to say, well, every 10 volts, it improves, you know, 0.1. And so, you know, let it get out to 100 volts and you're there. The other option is that when you double the voltage, it improved. You double the 0.2. When you double the voltage to, well, this is actually 50, it improved um, a little bit more than 0.2. So when you double the voltage again, another 0.2, double the voltage again. So that would be around 200 volts. You'd start to see something interesting in terms of efficiency that's that's also quite possible. That's probably more likely than it being a linear thing. And so the other question is, you know, why is this happening? And I would say that, you know, there, it, it, there's a reason that um, they do the high voltage lines. And that is that you have the same amount of power but there is less resistance because there's less current. Since there's less current, there there are less there's less for the electrons to bump into, um, and so you know you can use thinner wire and things like that. So something similar, I suspect, is being seen here. Now it's complicated with all of the um, impedance of the coil and things like that. But as you're going higher in voltage 
you're seeing this improvement. That's that's the the bottom line. Um, now, it's still not as efficient as an AC um, step down transformer or step up transformer like they have. Um, you know, on the power grid, that's probably more than 98% efficient. But this is um, 94, 94.6% efficient um, there at 60 volts. And you know, again, you can say, well, you know, no, it's not. You, you know, but one thing you can do, and I've done this, and I'll do it again, um, is instead of this one switch to short this out, you can just add another switch. And since everything's opto isolated. Now you run it off of here, let this go down to 9.5. This is starting, say, at 10. So you have, you know, this at 10, this at 10, this at 10. Run this down to 9.5. This goes up above 10. And now with the second switch, you just feed it back. And so if you're inefficient, then this goes, say, from 9.5 back to 9.6. If you're efficient, it goes from 9.5 back to 9.9. .9. And so I've seen that repeatedly, and that's why I'm saying I'm confident um, that that's 94.6% efficient. So, um, you know, I haven't made a video in a while, so the heck if it's a long one. Um, I didn't go as far as I wanted with the coils. I mean, what I've determined is that, um, you know, up to the um, uh, Wheeler's formula for the most efficient shape of a, a coil like this, um, you get improvement. Now, I suspect if I actually got a complete pancake coil, and then I think it needs to be a complete pancake coil wound just like Tesla showed in his patent and see if there's anything there. I don't, I'm not certain if you just got this half the size and then put another coil on top and hooked it up counterwound, whether you're going to see anything or not. But I haven't, I haven't investigated that yet, but it takes time. But I at least know a decent way to set up the coils. So, you know, lastly, I, I was putting it into this big cap or whatever. And I did see improvement past 60 volts. You know, it was big there, and then it went back, and then going back up further. Um, I haven't tried to normalize that to, to that. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I'll even bother to. Um, but it looks like there's improvement. It's hard to see because now you have less discrimination, less precision. And I don't know if it's leaking out faster with a different resistor network, as I said. But it does look like it continues. And it, you know, it's possible it continues linearly. In which case, you know, you only get, need to get out to like 100 volts. Most likely it's, it, it's going to be a doubling thing. And so you would need to get out to maybe like 300 volts as long as everything else is, is arranged just perfect with the timing and the coil arrangement and things like that. So I, get, I got out to 100 volts and then I went to 110 and that's when I blew it up. Kapoof. So in a moment I'll fix this and I'll just run it for a minute just so you see like what I'm doing. Again, you know, just all you can see is that. Um, but um, just a few more things uh, off the top of my head as I wrap things up. Um, you know, it's funny, I got this all there. There was a, uh, an enormous study out of Europe a few years back. It must have had a, like a dozen uh, PhDs and MD PhDs on it. And they, they looked, it was a retrospective um, uh, epidemiologic study looking at salt intake and subsequent um, risk of heart attack, myocardial infarction. The people with the highest quartile of salt intake had, from memory, and it might have been more dramatic than this, um, had approximately one half the number of heart attacks as the people with the lowest quartile of salt intake. <laughs> And of course, 
after you have a heart attack, that oh, you have to do, go on salt restriction. Enormous study. Um, so what I'm saying here is that um, a lot of what I'm going to be doing if, if I continue going forward with this is actually talking about an area where I have some experience rather than just rambling on with all of this. And I'm going to try and do a lot more with um, just looking at you know, medical studies, and I'll try and keep those brief. I'll try and make them like 10, 15 minutes. So the, the first one I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to look at um, uh, Fred Kleiner's use of IV vitamin C in the 1940s and uh, 50s and then onward. And he really popularized this, and it was near miraculous. I mean, he, he cured uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, cured, uh, I think, something like 22 cases of polio in a row, um, things like that. And just enormous amounts of IV vitamin C, which, you know, like amounts where if it was uh, salt or sugar, it would be toxic. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't toxic uh, with that much IV vitamin C. I'm getting off topic on that. So let me return to what I'm going to be working on with the experiments. I guess I'm just sort of saying if, if I can get my groove on with, with this, what I'm going to be doing is, you know, yeah, I'll keep talking about, you know, hey, this is what I'm doing with these electric experiments. But, you know, I mean, I, on the one hand, I don't know that much. Um, you know, on the other hand, I have a, a more efficient DC-DC trans, you know, buck boost transformer than I could find on DigiKey. So, so that's kind of neat. And I'm seeing these trends that are interesting and um, look to continue on with those. But there'll, there'll be sort of a bifurcation where um, I'll also have a stream of stuff where I'm just going to be talking about stuff that I have much more experience in and, you know, things like, oh, you know, salt's actually good for you or, you know, a half cent of, of, um, of baking soda um, dramatically decreases the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease, which is a huge killer. And, and you know, you don't want to be on, you don't want to be on dialysis. Um, so I'm actually probably a lot more useful that way. And so I, I want to, I want to get working on that. Um, uh, okay. So finally, where am I going with this going forward? There are a few things. Um, one, I'm going to, you know, work on looking at this as cleanly as I can now up to zero to 110 volts. And then I may, um, put in a, a, a charge pump and look at it out to zero to 220 volts. And, you know, depending on how good it is, maybe I won't show you. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to be gauche with anything, but we're not there yet. So there's no point in worrying about any of that, but that's a pretty interesting trend. Ain't it? Um, but there's, there's another thing that I'm very interested in and that is, and this will be a video, um, a different one. You know, when you discharge a cap in an LC tank circuit, the cap, you know, starts at 10 volts and goes down to zero, and then it keeps going. It doesn't care. And it goes down, say, negative, negative 8.5 volts, and then it goes up to, you know, 7.5, and then 6.5, and then 5.2, you know, and then, and it rings, and it goes negative. What I've seen is that when you go to higher voltage, so instead of it going from 10 to, what did I say, negative 8.5, now it goes from 10 to negative 8.7, negative 8.8. .8. And so, so there's a parallel there with this, but I don't think it's going to be exactly the same. Now, just bear with me. Oh, I'll show you one other thing that's cool, just an article. Uh, um, yeah, I'll show you that. Um, so, you know, if you had a, a coil with next to no inductance, you know, it's just going to get saturated. Or if you had a giant capacitor, you know, like one farad, then the coil just, you know, gets saturated. It's sitting there at its maximum field strength and then there's not enough you know for it to to shoot back to to bring the the cap you know it, it, there's that wouldn't work 
Now, likewise, if you have a coil with a huge amount of resistance, the what's going on is a time-limited event, and so that resistance is preventing the transfer of of current, and and it has to be transferred in a set amount of time, or it goes to waste, and so that would dampen the oscillation. But if you have a coil with high inductance and low resistance, you should get a more persistent oscillation. And then the question is, does that improve with higher voltage? And let me show you one last thing. So I was trying to figure out, you know, how do you make a, a clean fast switch that lets you transfer a lot of current and, you know, high high dB or DT. And so I found this and, you know, I maybe understood every third word um, or something like that. But he's talking about switching um, with MOSFETs. And, you know, there's your there's your circuit for for driving the MOSFET. And this, this was what was interesting. Let me see if I can find where they're talking about it. Okay, so they're talking about MOSFETs and they say a related yet more prob problematic effect is the occurrence of self-sustaining oscillations at turnoff. So in other words, the MOSFET itself becomes an LC tank circuit. It has capacitance and inductance. And when you turn it off, it doesn't turn off. It keeps ringing and it's self-sustaining. Now, one additional comment I would make to this is if you go back, um, it was the stuff I did when I, I um, had the, the um, data logging, that I used the Arduino as a data logging voltmeter. And so, you know, there's actually some method to my madness there. And the question I was trying to get at is when you pull off the inductive spike and you put it into the gather spike, does it change either the amplitude or the frequency of the resonance of the LC tank circuit? And the answer is no. It, if you leave it off, the tank circuit resonates at the same frequency and it goes down, you know, say it went down to 8.6 volts, negative 8.6, and then up to 7.5. Then you put it on where it's gathering the inductive spike down to negative 8.6, up to 7.5, exact same frequency. It doesn't seem to know it's there. So uh, they're saying that this is a self-sustaining oscillation. And there is the, uh, I, you know, I don't, I've never used an oscilloscope, but I know that, that I think that's an oscilloscope thing there. Um, now the time, that's negative uh, fifth, um, so, I mean, that's going really, really, really fast. I don't even know if you catch it with a, a standard kind of um, silicon rectifying diode. But that's what it is. That's just oscillating away. So, let's stop there. Um, there I, you know, I'm going to fix this thing, but, you know, all you'll see is zero, 10 volts, zero, 10 volts. Um, but... Yeah, that's what it is. You know, what do you make of it? That's that's what it is. It just keeps oscillating. And then, then they, you know, I mean, there's like no, like no acknowledgement of it being weird. They just basically, you know, we solved it. You put in a two UF, you know, you put in a, you know, this this amount of resistance, and now it stops oscillating like that. So problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh so much. Um, but uh, that's what that is. Yeah, I'm not going to, I got to rebuild this, but again, there's no point in showing that. So I um, had a lot of, you know, lost time to make up for, so it was a lengthy video. Hopefully I can, you know, uh, as I get my other wheel back here, uh, make, um, you know, more brief videos, uh, just kind of, you know, what I saw the past two, three days, if, you know, if I do some work there. And then, as I, I said, I'm, I'm you know, going to talk about things, you know, 
like, gee, salt's actually a health food. Who would have sunk it? Um, and showing the literature on that. I uh, also want to look at um, natokinase to break down the spike protein. Um, Dr. Peter McCullough is big on that, and I found a good article on that just to kind of summarize um, that could also be helpful to people. So uh, please feel free to um, subscribe and like, and um, uh, hopefully I'll have content on both of these things, the, the fun, silly electric experiments and um, the area that I have education and background in as well. So God bless you all and have a nice day.